chemical plant may be advised to evacuate. Hello, Sublation Media viewers, readers, um, book buyers <laughs> these days now. Welcome to the Sublation Magazine show. Um, I'm Ashley Frawley, as you know, and with me this week is Stefan Bertram because unfortunately, Doug is ill. Doug is ill. Let's all keep Doug in our thoughts <laughs> that he uh, manages yes. to get better. <laughs> thoughts and prayers for Doug. Um, so poor Doug has been getting uh, frantic messages from me every day for the last like five days and he's just slept through the past five days. So yeah, he's quite ill, but I've got Stefan here. How are you doing, Stefan? I'm good. Yeah. And I, was, we, I was about to try and convince chat that each like you put on the YouTube video is a prayer for Doug. <laughs> so this week we have a number of, well, the last couple of days really in the magazine, we have uh, quite a few interesting um, uh, contributions, including uh, an article from Noor Hariri on Bloomsbury's decision to cancel Nigel Bigger's book on colonialism, possibly because it contained some positive statements on colonialism, but perhaps not. Perhaps it was just kind of poor scholarship. I don't know. Um, so check that out. And we also have uh, coming out in the next couple of days an article by Arturo De Simone, who we have with us right now. Hello, Arturo. Hello. Um, Making sure that I have this correct, you are an author um, and you write for um, Sublation Magazine, but also Open Democracy, Compact Mag, Counterpunch, and many, many more. And if I'm not mistaken, are you also a poet? Yes, I write uh, poetry and, and prose and visual art as well. Well, okay. So uh, you've also written another article um, for us in Sublation, uh, what was it, a, a few weeks back now, and we had a stream about it. Um, and that article, well, why don't you give us a sense of what that article was about? Uh, well, th th that article is more like a first part of a, a subject that I wanted to write about and have been taking notes about, thinking about for a long time, which is the contemporary uh, use of the term decolonial and decolonialism. And uh, <clears throat> there are many, uh, it became trendy for a while to talk, to use decolonial as an adjective, but it's used in very strange contexts by uh, people who just got into uh, saying something about decolonialism or decolonization and it seems divorced from its original context uh, it seems somewhat ahistorical and this particular article I uh, I wrote uh, as expanding on how it's being used right now for example uh, there was a conference called decolonize russia which was a very neo neoconservative uh, and that, that was basically organized by the u.s state department right yeah yeah so they've they've appropriated this this language uh, i'm not one of the academics who's constantly monitoring you know the ways in which these institutions use language but it, it is very striking of course <clears throat> And so uh, I, I also, uh, I don't know if you caught that part of the article, uh, there was a lady, a correspondent for the New York Times who talked about decolonizing um, Kiev and how Ukrainians mm -hmm. changed by taking away the names of Tchaikovsky and Tolstoy uh, from streets yeah, not sorry, not in Kiev, in Lviv, right? That they're, they're somehow, that's, a, that's a revolutionary act of de decolonization, and I, I found this disturbing on many levels. And it, but it's very, mean, it really, really crushes the history of, of, of Lvov as a city, which was a city of great dispute, which can't be 
you know, coldly placed in Ukraine without implicating a lot of history of, of what happened with the collaboration with Nazism in the Second World War and so on. Absolutely, the book, yes, that goes completely unmentioned in the article. And so my, my concern then is how um, Americans exporting this terminology in, for example, Europe has a very different relationship with colonialism, at least the European names, or in the Euro, right, until the Vladimir Revolution, because they did not participate right, in the um, So um, by exporting this uh, alien, this new jargon, this trend, it might make some kind of strange breed with the mm -hmm. Slavic nationalisms in the region. Uh, because then Serbs can say, well, let's you know, be colonized. So that, that makes sense. Uh, um, and and uh, not only Ukrainian nationalists, can, but also others could possibly misuse this term. Right. Like the kind of the term comes, comes out of a North American context where the process there was very one sided after kind of the first century or so, where basically indigenous people lost and were crushed over and over again. But that's not the history of Eastern Europe, where kind of these countries did successfully avenge themselves over the Turks and over the Russians, often in, in brutal and bloody ways. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's also, you know, potentially a real problem. Like uh, once uh, I, I was in a few times I was in Greece and I heard some uh, an American uh, expat trying to get in touch with his Greek roots, his Greek American partly. And so he said, Greece is a post-colonial society. And so uh, in this context, they're referring to the Ottoman Empire. And also when the art festival um, Documenta, the uh, art festival from Germany, they came to do a mega events in, in, in Germany, Very post-colonial. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So they, they started using imagery like uh, old propaganda posters and imagery from the Greek Orthodox nationalist struggle against the Turkish. And so this was, you know, it's another very strange example uh, of using this out of, out of context because uh, what happened between Turkey and Greece is much more complex. Like in Greece, uh, there's a history of you know ethnic cleansing and uh, why are there no Muslims in, in where, where's the Muslim minority in Greece it's the only country in the Balkans where you can you struggle to find evidence of that so I think that it's a kind of kind of careless um, <clears throat> to uh, to phrase these things as decolonial this or that so one of the um, the well the sort of overarching um, theme of that earlier essay was also about um, uh, anti-feminism um, and Doug and I kind of used it more or less as a jumping off point for our own sort of discussion about masculinity and so on. <laughs> we like to do that. We we discuss the magazine but then it's just really our well, way I mean, into whatever we often came on here and failed to talk about my article for an hour. <laughs> you were talking about here at some point. We were talking about hair at one point. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I was talking about your hair at least. Oh. <laughs> well, if there's any opportunity to to you know, come on, it it, it takes a lot of work. This look at that. Uh, uh. Anyways, um, so is there anything that you um that you wish that we had touched on that you wish that we had really brought out in that discussion? Oh, um, well, yes. Uh, <clears throat> the. Uh, well, the, the, there were uh, a number, a number of arguments, but particularly uh, uh, the academic, uh, the idea that a lot of this, uh, what, what, what is, you know, the, the role in which uh, university education or college education becoming a new kind of high school diploma, that this is a big cause, the problem. Uh, of uh, men being dropouts and trying to find uh, uh, an exp a too simple explanation and saying that this is just the rise of women that's causing problems. It's more, I think it's, there are other roots, more complex roots to this problem and 
of uh, that's causing the the misery of uh, the Western male, which is a very real problem. And if we don't look at the complex, these the economic roots of that problem, uh, then somebody else comes along and gives them an explanation. And it might be a, a too simple explanation, such as, well, it's the rise of women, and that's uh, that can be comical in the North American context, uh, figures like Jordan Peterson and so on, but it gets much more dramatic in the uh, in the south of the world uh, when these when this dynamic uh, happens. Also, uh, I talked about uh, in the essay. I, I go into uh, it, it could have been perhaps divided into two, but I go into the problem of uh, drone technology and how. Drone technology has that be, began to really be exported during the Obama era. This it, it destroyed, in a way, kind of uh, an ethos mm -hmm. uh, among young young people who go into the military. Um, it's a it's a big moral problem, and the drone technology. I read, uh, among others, other books, Grégoire Chama, the French philosopher Grégoire Chama used drone theory. Uh, and I believe that, um, I personally believe that drone, and I argue that drone th technology was designed to destroy the role of the guerrilla mm. fighter and the role of the guerrilla form of warfare, which was always cause of preoccupation uh, among in imperialists. For example, the whole theory of war, applied theory of war of Guevara uh, during the past uh, century. So what's the link there between the sort of gender question and warfare? Um, well, uh, Obama promoted drone technology by saying this is a much more humane way to do war because instead of sending soldiers to fight, we have like a kind of uh, a software office or a video arcade somewhere in Nebraska. Uh, it's more, it's more in theory, more woman friendly though. Most of the drone pilots are, are male. I think that that will continue uh, that trend, uh, and Obama said the drones are more ecological, and this is in a way it, it does emasculate uh, soldiers. It destroys any traditional notion of this warrior ethos that that appealed to. I mean, soldiers they don't just sign up. Uh, of course, they sign up for material reasons, but there are other incentives. They have a certain quality. Not that I defend. Uh, I don't celebrate people wanting to do thrill-seeking in Iraq, absolutely not. Uh, but the drone technology, it undermines and emasculates uh, soldiers in a way. And it's similar to many people who talk about the crisis of men. They mention the mechanization of factories, for example, how it has undermined physical and analog workers. And I see something similar in, in, in militaries. I mean, it's obviously very similar that the drone replaces a pilot, replaces a fighter with a robot uh, controlled by a, a clerk, basically. So there's no, no traditional sense of valor is there. But the people resisting the drones, they are like the people who I, as I understand, you, you fought them uh, in, around Kurdistan. The, the jihadists, uh, they are the living, living the archetype of this traditional warrior. Uh, they are pursuing that archetype. They are the last representatives of it, doing this form of guerrilla warfare that the uh, security regimes were hoping to stamp out and erase completely. So let's, let's just kind of go back a little bit because um, so one of the, the the thing that we really tried to bring out, or that we thought was most interesting in that in that um, stream that we did a few weeks back, was this idea of um, 
a kind of loss of meaning and purpose that young men seem to be experiencing that is being or that young i think that just people in general are experiencing this sense of anime this like meaninglessness this normlessness this sense of being kind of like cut loose from tradition and not really being sure how you're supposed to live and what rules you're supposed to live by all of these sorts of things and it's being sort of interpreted through this gendered kind of problem and this gendered language I'm um, just wondering, are you familiar with the sort of mythopoetic men's movement? Uh, yes. Uh, well, a poet who I, who I like very much, um, Robert Bly, he, he was the leading, the, 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 the inventor, originator of that. I, I found, I, I did not read many of his stuff about masculinity because I was more interested in his critique of American poetry, he wrote a very controversial essay in the 60s about why American, North American poetry is lousy and conformistic. And he cited uh, many Spanish and Latin American poets, and I thought that that was great and uh, prophetic. And I was always hoping to find other literary critics like him. It's very sad that he died a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he was also quite a very much of the left, even though this Jordan Peterson uh, seems to be somewhat borrowing from Robert Bly without much of a attribution. To what extent was he like, was he of the left? Because he was sort of anti-war and was he like of the left in the sense of, it seems to me he was very much a romantic. And in that sense, he was more of the sort of part of the romantic anti-capitalist movement to the extent that I know anything about him. Um, that's just seems that's the impression that I got this idea of like sort of reconnecting to a lost and highly idealized past is a solution to the problems of the present. So that's like sort of characteristic of romantic anti-capitalism for me. Sure, yeah, he was more something like that. I don't believe he was a Marxist. About <laughs> Uh, he was uh, he was a uh, totally uh, he seemed to be just totally an artist and an eccentric. But um, well, left perhaps in this context is the wrong. I, I I also appreciate you don't have an extremely broad fuzzy definition of what left is. He was more like romantic anti-capitalist, but like he wasn't a xenophobe. He wasn't uh, he wasn't terrified of the Muslims uh, invading. He was more interested in exploring different traditions. I'm not sure he idealized the past. I think he was more of a Jungian uh, in the sense that, he, you know, in, in Jung there are these archetypes and uh, he believed that uh, having, that young men have lost their connection with certain archetypes that are very inspiring mythology from the Native Americans, yeah, it sounds pretty fascist, though. That's. <laughs> I mean, this, yeah, this sort of idea of like, um, I'm just, I'm kidding, I'm being facetious, but, uh, <laughs> but this idea of like going of like when I think when people cannot move forward, when you can't find meaning in any kind of forward-looking movement, you look back, um, and I and you know the early kind of roots of fascism were obviously in romanticism and this idea of like reconnecting with these archetypes, reconnecting with some lost enchanted past and trying to find some magic in society, um, some different, some ability to rise above the mass and find yourself some uniqueness in an increasingly increasingly homogenized world. All these things are characteristic of romanticism. Yeah, not, well, well the, the, the left, but the left has its roots in late romanticism. Feminism also has its roots in late romanticism, so does anarchism. And for, for that matter, you could also argue that fascism, especially Italian fascism, is very future-oriented, obsessed mm -hmm. with destroying tradition, destroying the romantic past, building everything from the ashes, build, making ugly architecture, having people ride bicycles. And, you know, that was the Italian aesthetic of fascism. So I don't yeah, know of course, that. but but then Germany sort of tolerated that for a short period of time before quashing it in the sort yeah, of... I mean, German, German, the, 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 the German uh, fascism, of course, had its horrifying cult of, of pagan antiquity, uh, and, uh, uh, but 
it was also very much concerned with the new man, uh, with the new, and with, uh, you know, I mean, for German fascists, uh, uh, realism also represented a kind of antiquity that they thought to annihilate. Um, <clears throat> So they were very much concerned with the new, with technology, with the autobahn, building these highways. They were very, they, with, uh, you know, building these, all, this, all this infrastructure that Germany still has. And so you could argue it both ways. You could argue that fascism has a fetish for Christianity or it has a fetish for paganism. You can argue that fascism is obsessed with the future, with destroying old, weak people and, and or like the past, you can argue that fascism uh, is obsessed with the past because they glorify pagan, they have this cult of antiquity. So fascism is very convoluted and so... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do, do, you know, do you know the story about Himmler and Hitler arguing about kind of ex excavations of ancient German ruins? No. Because Him Himmler really liked to dig these things up and like, wow, look at these these ancient iron age german villages and hitler was always like himmler you idiot like at the same time they were building these our ancestors the romans and the greeks were building great cities like why are you talking about this please shut up because we our history compared to theirs is pathetic and useless yeah <laughs> to this to this day i mean uh, somebody from you know the middle east commenting on racism from the north of Europe might say, well, you know, a few thousand years ago, those people were living in caves. And, you know, exactly. We, we had a culture, we, we had a nightlife, we had cuisine, they were living in caves, eating eating each other. So that, that's that's a common. Right. I mean, Britain's great ancient Neolithic monument is a, is a lot of stones. Um, but I, I think what's very interesting, which links the, the two articles for me is, until recently, I think the drones and kind of American imperialism in general came dressed very much in this wearing like the dress of feminism especially in afghanistan this was constantly emphasized um but now especially in ukraine kind of the feminist or, or woman kind of aspect of this is, is moved into the background and i think that's why your decolonial essay which is coming out for us soon uh, is very important because it it kind of emphasizes that the new strategy seemingly of, of imperialism is to dress itself in decolonial or, or an anti-imperial. And so the, the drones were given to Ukraine. Well, the, the drones we gave to the Afghans were, were dressed, you know, they were colored in pink. Now the, the drones that we're giving to the Ukrainians are, are dressed up in, in, in decolonial colors. So kind of, do you think this is kind of a, a viable and long-term kind of strategy for imperialism? Or do you think it's kind of something that's gonna come specifically in the Ukrainian context? And what do you think kind of the consequences will be? Um, I, I'm not sure if it's viable. I think that uh, ideologies are very interchangeable. Uh, they, it, it, the power is really chameleonic, and you know, like that CIA ad with the woke Latina rising in the ranks of CIA, asking people to join. I think that. Um, well, maybe that is the strategy for the long term. I don't know, um, but I it, it, it does um, it does coagulate with very some very nasty tendencies. Um, the, the, the main gist of my series on on decolonization uh, has to do with um, respect for memory and history. Like the way decolonize as a slogan is used, it's you often hear it in people in, in, in foundation at foundation events, charity events in Europe are talking about decolonial as if it's something that they can do, as if now Europeans can decolonize something. But of course, these were these were revolutions in which hundreds, you know, so many people died uh, in Indonesia, in Nigeria. Uh, in many, many countries in the 50s and 60s, and, and, and the, 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 the way people discuss decolonization completely eliminates the, the, the original thinkers of this movement, like Albert Memmi from Tunisia, like um, 
Kenya, uh, uh, Ruby Wakiongo, Franz uh, Fanon, of course, who I think invented the term. Uh, they're completely, they're referred to maybe as secondary sources, but there's no real exploration of this complex thinking what happened in the post-colonial era, why did these post-colonial regimes fail their people at liberating them? In, in the case of, um, and of course, a failed post-colonial regime is always good news for imperialism. Um, in the case of exporting decolonial stuff to the east of Europe, I think it's very dangerous because the, the, the language of empowering ethnic, ethno-tribal identity part of the decolonial um, tradition and rhetoric. Uh, Fanon did a lot of analyzing of these psychological forces that are unleashed when the people overthrow a regime, these irrational forces, because he was a psychiatrist. But superficially applying that in the East of Europe is very dangerous because the big problem in the East of Europe is this kind of call to, you know, ethnic tribalism, um, or, or claiming that the Turks um, are still, you know, that, that's exorcising the Ottomans, or exorcising foreign influences. Is a, you know, this is very dangerous in the East of Europe, and it shouldn't be carelessly, as this New York Times uh, columnist, Eric Salomon, uh, was, was doing, you know, saying that he doesn't even know the history of Lviv. Yeah, I mean, it's, so go ahead. It's, it's interesting because obviously the kind of de decolonization in Africa and in the Middle East came along with pan-Arabism and pan-Africanism. And so there was inherent in these kind of structures and came alongside them like a, a rejection of simply turning to isolated nation states with, you know, cleansed internal positions. Um, but there's a different situation which is meant to be going on with Ukraine and, and the rest of Eastern Europe, where it's not that there isn't this pan in inclination, there is obviously, and that inclination is, is towards Europe, but that's a much more, much different structure because it kind of, it inherently puts Ukraine not as kind of the leader of some kind of pan whatever movement, but is and obviously a, a nation which will be sub, subservient to, to Germany or France. So kind of the decolonial ness here really seems to disappear. It's as if like, you know, like Morocco fought for its independence, only then to 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 join with Portugal or something. You know, to join with, I'm sorry, like Portugal or whatever. I, I made up the example as as I was going; it didn't make any sense. But as if you know, as if kind of the the countries of North Africa mm -hmm. fought off their colonial masters, but only for the sake of joining like a Mediterranean economic bloc. I think it would be great uh, for them. I don't know. It would make more sense for South of Europe to be in a union with the North of Africa than South of Europe to be in a union with the North of Europe. That's a separate discussion. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, yeah, in, in the, I just, it's a good point you bring up about internationalism. But in the case of in the case of Ukraine, um, again, in the East of Europe, uh, like this. You know, Tony Jude, this uh, late, um, uh, I think he was, I'm not, I'm not sure if he was a Marxist, but he wrote about uh, these problems in the East of Europe, and uh, he was of the left, and he um, wrote of how, and this is very true, that um, many of the Slavic nationalisms, they, they emphasize a sense of the West being indebted to them, mm. because they are the guardians, they are the gladiators who have defended the West against the predators coming from the East, against the Turkish, against the Russians, in this case, but usually against the, the Turks, the Tartars, the, and, and so there's a sense of, you know, you owe us, we, we defend, the Polish nationalism has this as well. They'll say the great emperor Kazimierz, you know, fought to make Poland a buffer so that the barbarians would not crash the gates. And now you uh, don't respect us. And you also say that, you know, talk about, you, know, and you dare talk about the Holocaust and so on. Right? That, that's, that, that, kind of, that kind of dynamic is very alive in Slavic nationalism. 
And actually, I think that Israeli Zionism got that, that they, they inherited some of that, that legacy of telling the West, we are your defenders against this people. It's, it's very interesting that the Ukrainian literary theorist you, you mentioned in your article, Yeromenko, mm -hmm. um, I was just reading him earlier because he's been tweeting today comparing kind of Russia as kind of Russia is returning to the great horde, uh -huh. uh, which was this this Central Asian kind of uh, yeah. horse nomad empire which held dominion over most of what is, is Russia and Ukraine. Um, while Ukraine is expanding the border of Europe, but notable from the fact that I felt I had to explain what the great horde is to, to our audience right now, no one in Western Europe knows what the, <laughs> the great horde is. And so that's another interesting thing when these kind of nationalists try to export this kind of vision you mentioned, that their kind of view of things is not the view that exists in the West, and it's quite incomprehensible to them. Yes, these are references that they don't get that are long forgotten in the West. I mean, Zelensky often invokes this, they, the, the Great Horde, he says that Russia is like a mix of the Nazis and the Great Horde. Um, I'm sure that can be the butt of jokes in the West. Uh, mispronounce it but uh, certainly uh, yeah this so you have people speaking two languages because like this yeah, Yermenko uh, this literary theorist on the one hand he expects wokeness so he speaks the language of wokeness he wants people to be extremely sensitive about Ukrainian feelings to not hurt the feelings of Ukrainian national treat Ukrainians as another victimized minority, the way black people gaze um, under this Western concept of, you know, of this Western social contract, you're not supposed to say offensive things. On the other hand, Ukrainian nationalists are, well, they, they love to, they are very offensive about any kind of difference. Uh, they revise the history of the Holocaust to, to make, make up anything that's convenient for them. Know, and, and somebody who's, uh, who's of Jewish descent in the West and whose ancestors had to flee the area of Ukraine because of this Slavic nationalism and pogroms, we're, we're not allowed to say anything about that. Uh, you know, Google will, will, I don't know, send an algorithm or something. And, and so they, they, don't, they don't speak the language of political correctness um, when, it's convenient, when it's not convenient for them. They don't speak them amongst each other, but they expect the West to do that. And that's similar to what Erdogan does. Mm. Erdogan, Erdogan will say in a speech that, you know, uh, Orientalism, you know, cites, I don't know if he had somebody read that what Saeed's Orientalism to him, I don't know. He'll cite Orientalism in the speech, uh, but of course, um, if people get upset when he quotes, if he quotes Hitler, then he says, you misunderstood me. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, political correctness is a set of rules that the West is to abide by uh, when it comes to how the West deals with Ukraine, Turkey, Modi and India. Like Modi's uh, PR foot soldiers also, they said, there is a colonial mindset behind this BBC documentary, right? But, but they get to use all the filthy colonial language they want. They get to be racist, they get to be anti-Semitic, they get to be homophobic, whatever. So the, the rules apply to the West, because the West, in their view, is weak. So you mentioned, uh, you mentioned throughout the article, the one that's coming out, that um, there's this sort of misuse of decolonization and that as this language makes its way out of off of campuses and into everyday jargon, it, it sort of becomes really debased. And I can see that a lot in like the way that um, colonization gets thrown around and then sort of rehabilitated to, um, what's the word, not whitewash, but hmm, to frame what are sort of neoliberal policies when it comes to indigenous people in Canada, for example, it's like, oh, this is all decolonization and this is your culture, we're just giving it back to you. But what they're giving to them as their culture is just mainstream policies with turtles all over them. <laughs> like, see, that's, that's what you need. Um, but I wonder, is there something 
is it a misuse or is there something about the way that decolonization is conceptualized now that lends itself so easily to this kind of these kinds of uses? Because um, it's like uh, anything, it's almost like anything, I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, I just, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the difference between whether it's being misused or being, whether it's the way it's being conceptualized. Not sure. yeah, is, it, is it sort of like, is there a good kind of decolonization discourse that we can differentiate from these misuses? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that all the writers of the first wave of the anti-colonial and post-colonial movements uh, are very relevant today, uh, but uh, they should be circulated anew. Um, I like, um, well, some obscure thinkers like Albert Memmi or um, Roberto Fernandez de Tamar from Cuba, uh, who wrote about uh, Caliban, the Caribbean. Uh, I, I think the first wave of post-colonial, anti-colonial thinkers who weren't such academics, who were themselves sometimes even soldiers or fighters or, or, or just activists or just writers, or poets, uh, I think they're still very relevant, but the, they also talked about the, the problems of the post-colonial, why post-colonial regimes um, failed. And I think that today, the way people talk about decolonialism, I'm worried that it might lead to a situation where philanthropic institutions give money to elites uh, in, in, that are responsible for having betrayed these revolutions in the first place. Um, the point you make about austerity uh, is, is absolutely true. Uh, you see it in the, I don't know about the details of what, how, what happens in, in the Canadian situation. But for example, in the, in, I was reading about uh, in, in, in Leicester in the United Kingdom, uh, a manager came along and he says he's decolonizing the curriculum. And that means that he's cutting the budget for <laughs> I mean, Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Of course, the Canterbury Tales are, are not, a, it's not colonial literature that was written before colonials. So, so it's, a, it's a nice excuse to, to cut budgets uh, for austerity. Yeah, it's, a, it's an excuse to cut budgets. And it's also, <clears throat> ironically, a kind of form, a way of denying any kind of universal humanity. So you're saying, hey, you black people, this doesn't, this isn't yours, nothing to do with you, you people from Africa, you, you know, or you indigenous people, all of this, these things are all completely separate. But as Fanon said, you know, I am, you know, I am one thing, but I am a human being, which means that the Egyptian pyramids are as much, or the classical Greeks or whatever, I can't remember the quote, I'm butchering it, are as much a part of my own history as they are Europeans, right? Because you are a human being. Um, right. The African Shakespeare is just Shakespeare. What's that? The black Shakespeare is just Shakespeare. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's because we're all humans, right? So you're sort of saying like, no, we are fundamentally different from each other. And these things are not part of our shared legacy. There is no shared legacy of humanity. It's everybody has their own, their own thing. I mean, that's more colonial, actually, than post-colonial. I would say that that's, that's philo-colonial. So a lot of what's getting called decolonial, and I'll make this argument in, in, in the next essay after this one, is, is it's actually philo-colonial because they, they, they use this new language, whether, whether they borrow the colonial newspeak or whether they use the specific um, jargon of, of uh, that, that's associated with BLM now, uh, they, they use this language as if they are doing a kind of diplomacy, as if they are ambassadors of the, the whites or some you know, emissaries of some civilization doing negotiating with this or that tribe and negotiating with different communities. And, 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 and that is, that, that I, the patterns of colonialism, of, of, of the colonial mindset um, not to sound like Modi's spokesperson, but, but but these patterns of colonial psychology are very, very evident. That you, you, you're constantly performing an act of diplomacy as an ambassador of 
one group to the other mm. group saying, you know, well, you have, you know, you Africans or you um, Muslims or, or, or whatever. And uh, um, I, I, I am very, uh, I guess I'm, I've always been extra aware of this because uh, I, I was born and raised in a kind of post-colonial society, um, in the Caribbean, Aruba. So, uh, I, I mean, I, these these patterns are, I, I don't miss them. They, they're, they're very evident to, to, to me. One so, part of your article I found very interesting was the argument towards the end which suggested that basically kind of adopting this language of, of colonialism and decolonialism um, does its best to kind of inhibit any possibility of peace. Um, because under this kind of framework, only kind of maximalist solutions are acceptable. It can't possibly be that there is a, a, a compromise between Russia and Ukraine about what constitutes Ukraine because Ukraine is wholly in the right it's the nation which be, is being colonized. It fully deserves whatever borders it happened to have in 1992 and so on. Um, and also, if you want to move on to discuss it, you also compare this to the Palestinian situation where there is a rejection among some kind of leftist radicals of any possibility of a two-state solution. Um, yeah. Uh well, I mean, first of all, I think the fragmentation of any country is a terrible tragedy. Looking at what happened in former Yugoslavia, uh, I think the Russians are trying to take the opportunity to get some revenge for what happened in former Yugoslavia by doing this whole thing in Ukraine. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, the language of exorcism is very... Uh, is, 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 is a dangerous thing and uh, uh, adopting you know, the, the solidarity of this extremism is dangerous. Uh, I'm not sure I understood um, your question about decolonization and the, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, uh, relations. Uh, I think Russian fanatics could just as easily also appropriate this decolonial language. Donetsk or whatever. Uh, it would be, no, no, that's 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 what they do with Donetsk and Luhansk. They say, you know, self determination of nations is a fundamental right, and so these people should be able to determine that they're Russian. Yeah, uh, I mean, this is all leading to another another Yugoslavia uh, fragmentation. It's, it's horrible. Uh, when I bring up uh, Israel, uh, I'm more. Yeah, this could also be, be an essay on its own, perhaps, but I, I, I do compare, I think that's when the, the, the part of the left that's critical of how liberal centrists have this strange, you know, religious fanaticism on Ukraine, I, can, I, I, I think that could serve as a mirror to how, to certain positions that the left has taken, probably the, especially the celebrity left, that has taken on Israel. Uh, for example, um, when it comes to like when it comes to Russia and Ukraine, for some of us on the left who are anti-war, you know, it's very, it's, it's it's just very clear that you, you can't you can't ignore um, completely uh, the, the, the Russian uh, claim uh, on, on on NATO. It's you know many things are very evident to us. Um, but when it comes to, to, to Israel, Palestine, um, there are many celebrities in the Western left who seem to, they treat Palestine as a factory for martyrdom, to have a moral high ground always. And they say there's absolutely no point whatsoever in calling to enforce for the two-state settlement, um, for the enforcement of international law. Even though this has ne never been seriously attempted, two-state settlement, it's just it's been referred to in hollow speeches uh, by everyone from Clinton to Obama, but it's never been seriously enforced. And and it's the the only way to stop these atrocities is to end the military occupation. If you're a leftist, you shouldn't be you shouldn't want there to be more martyrs. You should want there to be an end to, to the military occupation. And the the the, the people on the ground, the, the political groups on the ground. Uh, in Palestine, as well as the uh, 
there's a leftist party in Israel called Hadash, uh, which is, it's not the liberal leftist party, it's, a, it's the Arab and Jewish Communist Party. Um, yeah. and, and they, as well as uh, Palestinian political groups, uh, they say they want to go back to 1967 borders, meaning to end the occupation. And so the first step to peace has to be to, to end the occupation, which is the you know, front line of these atrocities. Uh, and then you can talk about all the other all the other things. And there are people on the left who um, they are, you know, their their self righteousness. I think on Israel Palestine is very similar to the liberal center self righteousness on Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I think I see the similarity, and it, it, that's why it doesn't surprise me that someone like Finkelstein uh, is critical of both of these. Uh, the same. Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly interesting. It, it got me thinking because I was, I am, I don't know, I, I, you know, it, it seems very impossible for a two-state solution to happen. But when you think about it, it's like, that seems almost impossible, but a one-state solution seems certainly impossible. Like, there's degrees of impossible, and the, the least, like, the most plausible it is, is some kind of Palestinian state, how we get, like, not not in in it in, in, and in israel or alongside it but it's, it's really hard to see how that happens but it's impossible to see how there could be a one-state solution and just like an overcoming or a destruction of israel yeah uh, that's we try to argue with this in the uh the movement uh, uh dm25 uh mm -hmm. i was part of the foreign policy part the M25 for like three years or so. And we produced many articles and we had, a, we designed, a, we conceived a, a foreign policy that got the support from, got support from Noam Chomsky also, he uh, wanted to sign it. Uh, but the, the leadership came up with this, um, particularly um, the more famous, uh, member of the leadership, uh, Yanni Varoufakis, the Supreme Leader, he came up with this idea that, that, that the Middle East and Israel-Palestine is very similar to things that happened in Greek history. And so um, he said there has to be a one state there, a one state solution, overnight secular one state, and, and you can't say that the settlers and the illegal settlements have to leave because then you have a civil war uh, like something that happened in cyprus and you know this is like projecting european uh, experience onto the middle east because I mean, he was also, also the senior member of a government who is famously useless on the israel issue like it's, it's not like he was like <laughs> he was the chancellor of a government which was completely collaborating normally with Israel. Oh, you, you mean the Greek government? Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, he has the position of the, of the, of the Greek left, uh, position that's quite normal in the Greek left on Israel-Palestine, I guess, although it's, he's, a, he's a bit more creative. But uh, um, our struggle in DM25, uh, just, it reminded me of this whole virtue signaling on, on Palestine it's a tragedy because, uh, uh, you know, if we spread, if we fomented discussions, Europe could play an important role, uh, Europeans could play an important role in no longer enabling this horrible conflict that destroys uh, so many lives uh, by, you know, taking the first step to, you know, uh, mobilize popular opinion to end the occupation, but instead people want to wear a kefiye or March shouting Palestine from the river to the sea, and um, and I, I think that's um, yeah. In the case of in 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 in, in the case of in, within that movement, it was particularly revealing how people started to project European experiences, like saying you know, because uh, uh, you know I mean the settlers. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm getting too much into details for your audience. You know that's mm -hmm. because, you know. Like, like in Israel, the, the Israeli settlers um, are there because their settlements, their legal settlements, are massively subsidized by the state. 
It's the one affordable place to live in Israel, and they're protected by the army, right? So in our foreign policy proposal, we had a number of, in, within the movements, we, uh, we had a number of ideas uh, that were popular, uh, including uh, stopping, uh, you know, getting Europeans to, to, to stop, you know, putting money into these illegal settlements because Europe indirectly uh, uh, is helping finance that. And um, Yanis Varoufakis uh, and a few of his uh, people around him, they began to compete against their own foreign policy group in the M25 by uh, insisting that uh, if the settlers would leave the illegal settlements, this would lead to a situation like things that happened in Europe, like uh, the, the war in Cyprus, where different settlers you know, took up arms when they had to leave for former Yugoslavia. And they weren't looking at, they, they seemed to not really know much about that reality. They had a purely sentimental, position, Yanis told me, you know, when you were in diapers, I met Yasser Arafat in Agma Square. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and what did you do with it, mate? Huh? And what did you do with it? Nothing, like... Uh, nothing, no, no. Oh, yeah. So, I, I'm against all this virtual signaling because I care about these issues. So one of our, our uh, viewers said, once again, in all seriousness, this discussion is doing a very bad job drawing any principal distinction between performative ultra leftism and hegemonically left positions you just don't like. So are you dismissing dis uh, positions that you are not a fan of that you don't agree with as just people being performative and having a knee jerk reaction that isn't well thought out? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I hope. I hope not. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, what, what I saw kind of the connection being drawn in Arturo's article is often that the most ultra leftist positions are the ones that can be most easily taken up by kind of uh, mainstream politics. This is what we saw in the US around kind of police reform versus police abolition, where for like a few weeks in a crazy summer, the Democrat Party, Democrat Party was, was endorsing police abolition and these various city council passed motions um, saying that they're going to abolish the police or whatever. And obviously they couldn't do this. This was impossible and they didn't do this. And they basically they had an inbuilt excuse to not follow through with these politics because kind of an alignment with the most ultra position. While if they, it would be much harder for them to get out of actual sensible positions around police reform. And I think that's reflected in if you take an extremist position on uh, kind of the, the territories of, of, of Palestine or whatever, where if you say, you know, there's no justice done until the entire state of Israel is abolished, then you're just creating a situation where there'll never be any justice done in Palestine. Mm. I think, yeah, I think generally these, um, I don't know, what well, since we're using this language, let's say ultra left positions are very extreme positions. Um, tend to be like what people consider to be principled positions. Um, but I think they are, they often lack historical specificity. They're like sort of taking concepts or principles and then just applying them willy nilly to a situation that they have not analyzed. That they had, it's just, so you take this extreme position and just smack it onto the present without thinking about the specificity of the actual historical moment in which we find ourselves. And then you just wind up saying crazy things that are quite easily appropriated for all sorts of different purposes. It can give a sort of, I don't know, a concrete example of this where um, decolonization comes to be conceptual. This is what I was trying to get at before, that decolonization comes to be conceptualized as a return to what came before. Um, instead of, you know, decolonization doesn't mean that you restore everything as it was. This is not possible. Yeah. And so this opens up the door then for the, the what I was, you know, the example I gave before of people just like taking whatever present policies someone thinks are necessary and then just smashing some turtles on them and calling it decolonization. Um, and it just so easily becomes a conduit 
for all of these Western desires and romantic and all these like romanticized ideals and the Western culture's own desire to reject its present and search around in the past for its own um, for meaning and that sort of thing. So I think this is what what winds up happening is um, it, when you don't have. Uh, an actual analysis of what of a specific situation, and in fact, when you reject an analysis on principle, where you're like, no, no, what's the what's the right leftist position here? And that, and I'll just smack it on there. No, we must have sovereignty at all costs, or whatever it might be in the, in a particular situation. Now you tell me that I'm wrong about that. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so we've been talking for almost an hour. Um, what I wanted to, um, there was so much that I wanted to get into, um, particularly around um, whether or not, because, you know, I found the whole, like, I find the whole gender and femininity, masculinity argument so interesting, and there's lots of stuff that we didn't get into there. But I wonder, do you have, uh, and also the decolonization, the way that it, it's being used to whitewash war, um, but do you have a uh, um, time to join us in the the parrot room, the second half of the the Patreon um, session? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. So what I'll do is I'll I'll close this out, and we will get into the nitty gritty. I I learned all about Andrew Tate, and I know it's got nothing to do with anything. But <laughs> we could have talked about that too. I haven't I haven't seen any of his videos, but I've heard of him. So yeah, uh, I find it to be weird and interesting and horrible in so many ways as everyone else does so uh, we'll talk about that in the patreon and uh so i will see you all then thank you so much for joining us where is my outro come on outro where is it this is fine i was, I was arguing in the comments anyway okay <laughs> in the case of nuclear or radiological fallout People living around potential targets such as military bases and chemical plants may be advised to evacuate.